Hello guys, I hope you're doing well. If you hear my voice, please just write that my voice is clear so that I could continue in this live streaming. Okay, cool. Uh, this is the first live streaming on uh, Syriana Analysis uh, Facebook page. I did several live streamings on the YouTube channel, uh, but the audience of the Syriana Analysis Facebook page uh, sometimes different from the audience on Syriana Analysis YouTube channel. So I dedicated this video to speak um, about uh, several issues. On top of that, um, what happened yesterday in uh, Damascus and the upcoming battle in Idlib, uh, where the it seems the mother of battles of all battles could happen there. Okay, this is good. We heard guns good. Cool. Uh, first of all, yesterday uh, on Syriana analysis, uh, we or I reported that uh, there were. Uh, airstrikes um, on Al Maze International Airport. Uh, it was a preliminary uh, report coming from Syria, and uh, a lot of reputable sources assured that there were airstrikes on Al Maze International Airport. However, after almost uh, 50 minutes to one hour to the explosions, the huge explosions that happened in Al Maze International Airport. Um, we came to the conclusion that uh, there was a mistake, uh, there was another incident inside the, the airport which wasn't an airstrike, which wasn't an, uh, an enemy strike, which wasn't a bombing or anything else. Um, the government uh, says that uh, there was an electrical fault, or electricity fault that uh, happened in uh, while carrying, it seems, the um, uh, ammo depots. Uh, but on the other hand, also other uh, Syrian sources say that there were um, logistical mistake in uh, transporting this uh, weaponry. Uh, inside the uh, uh, Al Maze International Airport, which led to this huge explosion. So no Israeli airstrike, no outside, no American airstrike, and uh, no hostile uh, missiles on Al Maze. It's it's natural that most people will believe, will think that it is an Israeli uh, airstrike or American strike because we are living now in. Um, let's say at the time when uh, the Americans, the French, the British are threatening to uh, bomb Syria uh, because claiming that the Syrian government could use chemical weapons uh, in, in Idlib. So everybody uh, predicted, was pre were predicting such kind of things, but, unfor but fortunately, let's say, I don't know if you, I want to say fortunately, but uh, unfortunately there were many deaths inside the airport, martyrs from the Syrian army side, and uh, yeah, but things are under the control now. Now moving to uh, the issue of Idlib, uh, it seems that uh, there is this usual diplomatic uh, action and within the corridors of the UN Security Council, a lot of meetings, a lot of pressure around the Syrian government and um, trying to stop this uh, operation from happening. Uh, we have to be clear in this. Idlib is the backyard of Turkey and only the Russian and Turkish negotiations could lead to fruitful results in, in, in Idlib, whether it is uh, that the Syrian army would strike this uh, city militarily or Turkey could succeed in breaking uh, the ties between Al-Qaeda and other factions uh, in, in this area. If Turkey succeeds to break the, um, the ties between Al-Qaeda and other military factions, the other military factions are weak enough to uh, accept reconciliation, not because they want reconciliation, but because they are forced to accept reconciliation. And then the Syrian army would only fight Al-Qaeda. Also, only yesterday, uh, Turkey declared Hayat Tahrir Sham, HTS, 
which is Al-Qaeda, in uh, formerly known as Al-Nusra Front, which is Al-Qaeda's wing, military wing in Syria. They declared that uh, Al-Nusra is um, a terrorist organization. This is an indication that Turkey failed to break the bond between uh, Al-Nusra uh, or Hayat Tahrir al-Sham with other uh, militant Salafist armed groups in, in Idlib. So this could be a green light from the Turkish side. This is one of the interpretations uh, for the Syrian army to uh, advance. But in all cases, whether there is a green light or not from the Turkish side, there is a determination and the decision has been made uh, by uh, the Syrian uh, government and the Syrian army to liberate Idlib. Now, all this media uh, hype surrounding uh, Idlib, because in Idlib uh, there are many... Um, uh, the Western governments invested a lot in a lot of NGOs, in a lot of uh, organizations, armed groups, medical groups, uh, so-called civil groups, and all these people are their proxies, including the white helmets. Now, in, in most areas, the white hel helmets were evacuated uh, and bust to Idlib, and now these white helmets are there. And if there is any side that is able and has the technical and logistical abilities to um, do a false flag chemical attack is uh, the white helmets, as they did in, in Duma, where they claimed that the Syrian government used uh, sarin gas, which the OPCW report uh, says that they were chlorinated materials, <laughs> which, which you could find even in the drinking water. So we don't know yet when uh, the operation will start. We are now in uh, the beginning of September. 2018. Uh, I predicted uh, one month ago that it could start in October because the Syrian government uh, will give time not only for uh, reinfo sending reinforcement and employing the uh, forces and surround the, um, the last terrorist held uh, area but also to give chance for diplomacy and politics uh, between uh, Russia and Turkey. Will Turkey uh, abide by the understanding? So, and what will be the future of the Turkish forces in Idlib? This is uh, something we will figure out when the operations start in, uh, in, in Idlib. So, uh, so, as I mentioned, it could start in the next couple of weeks, maybe at the beginning of October, because uh, uh, some Syrian reports uh, say that uh, uh, there is a deadline or timeline uh, that has been put by the Syrians and the Russians that Idlib should return to the Syrian sovereignty in uh, at the end of December, just like uh, Aleppo. In 2016, at the end of 2016, in December, I believe 25th or 28th, uh, Aleppo was liberated, and the same would happen in Idlib. In Idlib, however, there are uh, multinational uh, jihadists. Uh, unlike Aleppo, in Aleppo, there were, of course, multinational jihadists, but they were coming from uh, northern Idlib southern Al to southern Aleppo to to help their uh, jihadi uh, friends in uh, in Aleppo but the case in Idlib is different because their headquarters are in Idlib and we are talking about strong militants from Uzbekistan from Turkestan uh, the Uyghurs they are very strong in this area. Their numbers are the with their families could reach to twenty thousand Uyghurs in this area. Saudis, Egyptians, uh, from many other uh, nation nationalities. I just posted on Syriana Analysis Facebook page a video, German jihadi uh, group in in Idlib, and these people are have nothing to lose. 
because I believe their countries will not accept them. So the uh, the only way for them is to fight and continue to fight. And the, and these people, these multinational jihadists, they are leading the military groups in uh, in Idlib, and the Syrian fighters are second class uh, fighters, let's say. And today uh, we have seen pictures. I will post them tomorrow on Syriana Analysis Facebook page uh, that these so-called rebels are preparing um, execution scenes in uh, Idlib in order to uh, hang any Syrian citizen, civilian, who says yes for reconciliation, who says yes for political solution with the Syrian government. And this is, uh, uh, um, let's say, a technique of terror by uh, these militants to uh, prevent the scenario of uh, Dara. Eastern Ghouta and Homos in, in Western Kalamun and in many places where the militants gave up their weapons uh, and they just went to Idlib or they did the reconciliation with the Syrian government. So, uh, in my opinion, I rule out uh, the possibility of reconciliation with most of the uh, terror groups in Idlib. But this could change after uh, starting the military operation because when the military operation starts, and I guarantee you that in the surrounding of Idlib, the military power that it, by the Syrian government, the Syrian army and the allied forces, the, this, this huge military power that is surrounding Idlib, we haven't seen this kind of, this amount of uh, firepower, manpower, and even the weapons, the Western weapons, the American weaponry that the Syrian government captured in southern Syria, in Idlib, from the militants, they are transferred, transported now to Idlib, uh, so that the uh, the Syrian army will use even this weaponry against uh, the militants. So I guarantee you that the amount of manpower is very huge, the fire, the amount of uh, firepower is very huge, and the Syrian army is able to liberate uh, Idlib. And all this media hype now by the Western government and Western media is not only because of their proxies in Idlib, because, but because of what's after Idlib. If the situation in Idlib is uh, restored uh, to its previous status and the sovereignty of Syrian Arab Republic is imposed on this area, the next step could be in northern or eastern Syria. The next step is uh, could be in Afrin, could be in Mimbij, could be in Hasake, Kamishli, in the uh, eastern uh, parts of the Euphrates. So the Western governments, and especially the American forces, the French forces, the British forces, they, the forces, they have to choose whether to stay in Syria and face the repercussions of uh, maybe uh, some sort of uh, military resistance against their presence, illegal presence in Syria. The Syrian government considers them an occupation forces, and according to international law, they are, in, they are occupation forces. So Syria has the legal right to use force, but uh, of course Syria will choose the first option which is negotiation but even the negotiation is embarrassing for the americans because what are they going to negotiate for they, they know that they have no future in syria and their presence is illegal and what kind of compromise they can do with the syrian government they are asking for the iranian and hezbollah forces to leave syria and the syrian government was very clear in this regard hezbollah and iranian forces are not leaving syria unless the entire Syrian Arab Republic is liberated, not only from uh, the Islamist terrorists, but also uh, by foreign occupation forces. And even after the uh, liberation of Syria, there could be a need for uh, um, forces, additional forces by Iran and by Hezbollah to impose peace and security on every in all the geography of Syria for a couple of years and in order to prevent some sort of blow ups uh, 
maybe by certain angry Islamist element and elements in Syria because not all people who are reconciling with the Syrian government are happy some of them are forced to accept that so we could need uh, their help in uh, reconstruction we could need their help in rebuilding the Syrian uh, army uh, the Syrian army suffered from huge losses after uh, the war and tens of thousands of its uh, fighters uh, martyred during this uh, long war so uh, also the and also the infrastructure of of the Syrian uh, the Syrian army it could it should be renewed again so uh, let's see how things will uh, develop in the near future and in this regard uh, I would like for uh, you guys to be part in this media uh, coverage media war let's call it media war because the other side is launching media war on syria to prevent syria from capturing uh, this last uh, so-called rebel stronghold in in idlib so uh, they they have all their um, channels huge corporation channels but uh, we have our also platforms we have the social media and despite all this uh, suppression of our voices on uh, social media including on Facebook Twitter YouTube uh, we are still able to reach to millions of people around the world uh, and if you wanna one of the friends are asking how you by sharing the information around when Syrians like myself we have many people on on social media like myself speaking a good English fluent English and we are posting a lot of materials coming from Syria and some of them are even inside Syria so guys whenever you see materials be active not passive share them uh, show them to your friends try to influence the opinions of the people we uh, take the position of a second track diplomacy second track diplomacy is when you um, talk to your neighbor to your friends to your friends of what's uh, going on in syria because it's very important to gain the hearts and minds of people it's very important to show the reality of the matters in syria at the end uh, uh when 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 the war started in syria believe me there were areas in syria that been fallen in the hands of the terrorists thanks to the media support because uh, at some point uh, some syrian soldier for example is on the front line and he was watching some uh, media news outlets and etc and he thought that his position will fall and the uh, these terrorists are coming uh, for him and he left his position for example this was an act of terror by them they succeeded in 2011 2012 but then we uh, created some sort of uh, balance in this uh, regard and in Syrian analysis I'm proud to say that we played a very little very little uh, role in in uh, opening the eyes of uh, uh, of the people and I, I receive uh, tens of comments on especially on YouTube uh, that thank you man you were an eye-opening for uh, for us and we were looking for uh, such kind of source to understand the situation in Syria so guys if you want to uh, not only if you want I would like to invite you to join Syriana analysis YouTube channel where I post most of the important videos and analysis just go to on, on YouTube and uh, check uh, type Syriana analysis and it, it you will find it easily and uh, there I post uh, a lot of videos especially analysis in regards to Syria I try to make them short and commentaries and stuff and also I host people in on live streamings and sometimes interviews there so uh, I believe there you can find their valuable information on Syriana analysis YouTube channel on face on the Facebook page I try to post more more or less news on, uh, in this platform and there I tend to post more analysis on, on, uh, on the YouTube channel so most of my, of my effort are is uh, dedicated on YouTube but on Facebook since there is uh, this censorship going on now and the purge and a lot of things going on and the algorithm games please make sure to not only to subscribe but also 
when you go to uh, for example there is the section of like uh, or and be and next to it it's it's written following and if you click on the following you will see uh, you have the option of see first please click on the see first so that you can see all the posts and i'm trying to post on syrian analysis facebook page at least one post per two hours so almost i believe 12 posts per day and I'm trying to cover the different aspects, uh, not only the war, but also the returning of life to uh, Syria. Now, guys, if you have any uh, questions in regards to the ongoing war and or any other thing uh, related to Syria, I am I have time and uh, um, I'm in the good mood, let's say. <laughs> to answer anything uh, you want in this regard i will um do my best to do more live streamings so that you guys uh, also we have uh, this kind of communication virtual communication not only on youtube but also on facebook i will check some of the comments Hanin, most of uh, the UN Security Council members, especially France, UK and the United States, they mocked and they um, underestimated the statements of uh, Dr. Bashar Jafari, the permanent uh, representative of the Syrian Arab Republic at the UN. And they called it, for example, the British ambassador, she called it fake news and Russian propaganda. Uh, and even the American side, they ruled out the possibility that Al Nusra Front or White Helmets could do such an attack to provoke a uh, foreign invasion or attacks on Syria. It's very unfortunate that we are dealing with people very dishonest the least to say in the UN Security Council thank you very much David Gillen if I pronounced your name correct uh, I really appreciate your support and wish for peace uh, to Syria and this is what uh, the the main goal of, of Syriana analysis uh, to promote for peace but peace cannot be restored before defeating the uh, terrorist organizations in Syria. Uh, other than that, we will have uh, terrorist enclaves causing a lot of troubles in our uh, lives. Yes, Ali, it's, it's a military air base. It's not a civil, uh, it's not an international airport. I didn't say it's an international airport. I said Al-Mazza, I believe, Al-Mazza International Airport, did I say? It? It's Al-Mazza uh, Military Airport, you are right. Michel Haldi, you're writing French. The last time I uh, <laughs> I read or spoke French was in 2010 in, in Paris, where I studied at Sciences Po. I did one year uh, échange uh, program in at Sciences Po, uh, European Affairs Studies. Hello, Said. Ah, is good. Okay, Georgios. Ahli and Salimo. Okay, guys, that was all for today. Uh, uh -huh. Armenian Kingdom. Is there any definitive sources you can use to open the eyes of people who refuse to believe the truth? The the, the sources that I uh, highly recommend for people are not uh, media outlets, are um, people inside Syria. We have many Syrians inside Syria. I will try to do a list, by the way. Thank you for this, uh, uh, for this uh, comment. I will do a list of people uh, or pages that you can guys follow, trusted sources, people who were in Syria or people who are in Syria right now, whether they are Syrians or not, so that you guys can follow these people and uh, try to understand the situation there very closely. A lot of people are um, com doing commentaries in this uh, regards. So, I promise you to do an article, uh, to publish an article on Syriana Analysis uh, website where I will list, uh, put a list of trusted sources so that you guys can follow their work on uh, social media. 
Agam Pandit, how do you view Hafez al-Assad? <laughs> this is very uh, complicated question, my friend. Uh, one cannot address this in uh, one uh, or two or three minutes. Uh, I would just say this, that Hafez al-Assad came to power uh, in the 70s, uh, where Sir Syria was experiencing uh, a lot of coup d'etats, many coup d'etats, every year there could be two or three coup d'etats, and there was uh, political instability. Hafez Assad came and he imposed authority and security with iron fist. Not only that, he built what we call now the contemporary Syria. That means he built the infrastructure of Syria, the universities of Syria, the educational system of Syria, the economy of Syria. So a lot of people or authors, they describe him as the uh, builder of uh, the modern Syria. And uh, a lot of people also say uh, without this process of building Syria, uh, during the era of Hafez al-Assad, we couldn't have been able now to resist uh, this uh, Muslim Brotherhood Salafist uh, invasion of, of Syria. And he also faced similar uprising in uh, the 80s. Uh, in, it started in 78 and ended in 82 by the Muslim Brotherhood. At that time, they were also supported by the Americans, the Israelis, and uh, even at that time, Saddam Hussein uh, supported the Muslim Brotherhood, and uh, they did unbelievable atrocities in Syria. At that time, my father was in the Syrian army, and he keeps telling me stories how these uh, terrorists of uh, Muslim Brotherhood were slaughtering people on their sectarian and ethnic identity. Uh, yes, Hanin, um, China is already investing a lot in the suburbs of Damascus and uh, they have no problem in transactions uh, actually in Syria. Uh, the Russians will have the biggest share of uh, the reconstruction in Syria. They were the biggest, let's say, uh, contributor to uh, the victory of uh, Syria. Uh, Iran will have uh, a big share of the reconstruction. Uh, China. Iran, uh, Russia, India, Pakistan, Brazil, uh, and I believe South Africa. Um, basically, the BRICS countries and all the countries who refuse to uh, launch uh, or be part of the regime change project. <laughs> the Americans and the, and the Europeans are saying we will not be part of this reconstruction uh, process. Good, that's that's good <laughs> because that's the only good thing that we heard from them in the last seven years. Because we don't want you to be part of the reconstruction of Syria. Because we know if you if you give Syria one million to reconstruct one school, they impose political conditions for that. So we don't need their um, uh, reconstruction plans. Arem Beverian, um, believe, yeah, I mean, I will tell you a story. In Idlib, the white helmets are infiltrated. This is an information, not, uh, not, uh, not an analysis. Uh, we all know that in any, all the places that the Syrian army uh, entered, they had minders and they had people collaborating with them among the military groups, uh, even in the higher ranks. The white helmets are infiltrated and what we are receiving, these leaks are from our people in, in, in the white helmets. And those are credible information. And the first time when uh, al Mayadeen and the Syrian government both they revealed some uh, details of the chemical uh, of transporting chemical materials in Idlib, the white helmet changed their locations. Now they are in in Jisushur. The chemical materials are in a church in Jisushur and in the National Hospital of Jisushur. This is the second time we, uh, the sources inside the white helmets are giving information of the places of this. So the first time I believe. Uh, this this uh, leaks caused uh, embarrassment for uh, the Western government, especially the British. The British, the Brits 
have a major role in this because they are the major founder and uh, supporter of the white helmets. Will it happen? It could happen, uh, not only not, not now, but after one week or several days after the uh, offensive of the Syrian army uh, begins against these terrorist organizations. This is their last, last chance. If they lose Idlib, it's over. So uh, the experience of the previous uh, uh, battles prove that they could do anything to uh, ignite uh, foreign intervention. They were calling it since 2011. They want it until now. I don't think there would be an intervention like Boots Underground, American Invasion. Or it could. They will be uh, if such false flag attack happened. There would be airstrikes hitting certain places. This could be. This time could be harsher than the ones before, but it won't change the equation underground. Nothing could change the military equation in Syria and nothing could prevent the Syrian army from uh, capturing Idlib. This is not um, some sort of slogan. This is information. The, the decision has been made. Idlib is uh, going to be part of Syria again very soon. That's true, Hanin. Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra and in collaboration with the White Helmets, they have kidnapped 44 kids and uh, and hundreds of civilians, not only kids. And uh, the information also indicates that uh, this time, if a, when a fo if a false flag a chemical attack happens, female volunteers from the White Helmets will take part in the rescue operation where they will film all these things. So let's see. Thank you, Wakas. Uh, Hanin, I have no faith in the Americans and I have no trust in the Americans that they could build uh, one bridge in Syria. They destroyed Raqqa entirely. They wiped it off the map. And if they wanted to rebuild it, they would have done it. They already, in the last many months, uh, Raqqa is free of ISIS and they haven't built a single bridge in, in uh, Raqqa and they haven't restored the services and the uh, institutions to that uh, city. Ahlin Rim Kifek This I will, I will, uh, Kate Catinella, I will tell you a story that happened in 2012. I believe in mid-2012. There was a massacre called Hula Massacre in Homs. And uh, at that time, uh, the entire, of course, international, uh, this European and Western governments, they accused the Syrian government for this massacre that tens of kids were slaughtered with knives. And there are videos, you can find it on, on YouTube. Hula massacre. This massacre led to uh, that the, the, um, the European governments withdrew their ambassadors from Syria and cut their diplomatic relations with, with Syria. After, I believe, one month, there was a uh, German investigative journalist in Syria. I'm not, I'm, I'm not remembering now his name because I always forget names. He was in uh, Hula and he interviewed uh, victims, fa 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 vi family members of victims and he found out that the people who died in, in the Hula massacre, they were from uh, an Islamic minority sect and this, the so-called Free Syrian Army supported by the West, they slaughtered them because they refused to join this so-called revolution. And they accused the Syrian government for this massacre and Europeans withdrew their um, ambassadors from Syria. It is a very ugly and disgusting act. So they have done worse than this. So I won't be surprised at all if they, uh, they use this kidnapped people in their upcoming uh, chemical theater uh, to accuse the Syrian government. And of course, nobody will listen in Duma. 
when the so-called alleged chemical attack happened, the second day the Americans came and they bombed and the OPCW investigators were in Damascus. They didn't even wait for the OPCW to do investigations because they don't care. And they know there were there there wasn't any chemical attack in in Duma, and they know that Syria doesn't have chemical weapons because the Americans themselves, they destroyed the Syrian chemical weapons in the Mediterranean. They themselves destroyed it with their with their uh, experts. Uh, Michel Davidson, yes, you can go to Syria. Uh, both for vacation and as a journalist you can uh, apply for a visa uh, I don't know you, in which country do you live unfortunately in most European uh, countries there isn't uh, embassies uh, but there are certain uh, for example in Berlin you can find an embassy so you can you can ask them it's not difficult guys to go to Syria nowadays and most of my friends they go to Syria, I mean non-Syrian friends, they go to Syria and they take a visa. And it's not uh, difficult um, to, <laughs> as, as some people think, that it's, 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 it's an easy, easy thing that you just need to bring your papers and it takes, uh, I believe, one to one, one and a half month to get a visa. They need to do security checks because you are going to a war-torn country. Thank you very much, Sylvia Eagle, for your kind words. Uh, Aren, um, after Idlib, the ne the negotiations with the Kurds are from this from a couple of weeks ago. It started, and uh, I am hopeful that these negotiations could see good results. The Kurds could have their cultural full cultural rights, they could have certain compromises by the government, but they, they won't take any kind of federal system or uh, they can't take the away the sovereignty of Syria. So all this is, uh, it depends on, on the results of the negotiations, but yesterday Walid al-Mallem said that we are negotiating with the Kurds and we are positive in this regard and I hope this uh, because Kurds at the end are Syrians and we hope that they return to Afrin and in every place that they were expelled by the Turkish backed terrorists uh, when the Turks uh, I mean withdraw from Syria they have no choice but to withdraw but it will take time and a lot of efforts not only military efforts but also diplomatic efforts and uh, <laughs> the economic crisis in Turkey could have positive uh, results on, on, on the Syrian scene and uh, Syria could uh, benefit from this crisis to corner uh, Turkey and uh, kick them out of uh, Syria but we are talking about at least two years after Idlib this entire situation could be solved till 2020 so in 2021 there would be uh, elections uh, parliamentary elections, presidential elections, after redrafting the um, Syrian constitution. Hello, Mania. Allah hayiki. <laughs> Zeno Akten. This is a one million dollar question. There, I bet there is any political analyst or observer could answer this question. Where will the terrorists of Idlib be sent? <laughs> Maybe to Europe, I don't know. <laughs> there no more green buses from Idlib. So where are they going? Uh, I believe the Syrian militants will have the chance to reconcile, give up their weapons and return to their normal lives. The foreign multinational jihadists will either die or uh, there would be certain deals, secret deals with their governments to deport them and then they, they could be sent to the prisons of their governments. Or I don't know, because in Canada, for example, <laughs> they, they host the ISIS fighters with open arms and they send them to rehabilitation schools. <laughs> Kate, um, the 
the white helmets and the Kurds are totally different stories. The Americans are have different cards to play in Syria. The white helmets are one of them. Is one of them, and uh, the Kurds are the other. Uh, but after defeating this white helmets phenomena, the Kurds are already negotiating with the Syrian government, and uh, I don't want to give conclusions before uh, we see the results of these negotiations. We give a chance for diplomacy first. Paul Shamas. What happened in Kamishli is that the Kurdish militias, they closed uh, Christian, Assyrian and Armenian schools because uh, these schools refused to uh, teach the curriculum of the Kurds. Uh, the Kurds were imposing their Kurdish language and Kurdish curriculum on the Assyrians, Armenians, Christians. They were protesting uh, that they don't want to learn Arabic or they want to learn the, the Kurdish language beside the Arabic language and they were saying, oh, we are oppressed in Syria and all this stuff. Now they are, impo they are doing the same thing with the, the Assyrians and with the uh, Armenians, with the Christians um, in, in that particular area. So there were problems and uh, the people, the civilians went to the streets, they raised the Syrian flags and they called for cheered and called for the Syrian government to come uh, um, for their help. The intervention of the uh, Lebanese uh, Hezbollah uh, was first in order to secure uh, the borders with Lebanon, but the threat uh, was grown into radical extent, uh, and uh, Hezbollah had to fight not only in, on the borders with Lebanon, but also to their resort in East Syria. At the end, a uh, few days ago, when Bashar Jafari, uh, Syria's permanent representative at the UN, said, we are not alone. We are part of uh, a coalition or part of an axis. It's called the axis of resistance in, in the Middle East. And if Syria crumbles, the rest will crumble. If Hezbollah crumbles, the rest will crumble. If Iran crumbles, the rest will crumble. And this resistance is uh, growing uh, nowadays. Now we have the um, the Yemeni uh, horses in Ansarullah in in Yemen. Uh, we have the uh, Iraqi uh, mobilization uh, forces in Iraq. So it, Syria is not alone, and uh, Hezbollah, because Syria helped Hezbollah a lot, not only in 2006 uh, war with Israel, but even before Syria had uh, um, open armed depots for Hezbollah uh, in its fight against uh, Israel, Israeli occupation forces. So Hezbollah knows the geopolitical importance of Syria and they came for help for, to Syria by the invi in, uh, in, in invitation by uh, the Syrian government. But in the future, they could live after the defeat of the terrorists or they could stay in Syria for a certain uh, time. There is no timeline for them or deadline for them to stay or live uh, from Syria. Um, I don't think there is there could be any kind of social or um, political problems if uh, Hezbollah stayed in, in Syria. And I think it's a necessity before we reach full... Uh, stability in uh, in Syria. <laughs> the the French mini French minister always makes such um, bizarre statements. <laughs> that Bashar al-Assad could have won the war, but he won't win the peace. Oh la la. <laughs> What a strong statement, please applause. <laughs> as if as if anybody listens to the French opinion in, in Syria. This is something that the French and the British are always like uh, angry. 
more angry because Syrian officials, they don't mention the British and the French. They don't give them any uh, value. They always mention the Americans. So the French are trying uh, to say, we are here, please give us some importance. <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't know if there will be, I don't think there will be a civil war in, in, in Turkey and we don't hope that there would be a civil war because the civil war in Turkey will have uh, negative repercussions on the entire region. Turkey is a multinational, multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-sectarian, multi-religious country and it has its extensions in Syria, Iraq, um, in the Caucasus area. Um, so we hope uh, that they won't be any kind of civil war because we want uh, a peaceful region for everybody despite the fact that Turkey uh, has played uh, the worst of the worst uh, roles in, in this war and they were, had a major role in supporting the vast majority of the terrorist groups in Syria and opening the border for multinational terrorists, robbing the Syrian oil, robbing the Syrian uh, infrastructure, the um, factories and everything. But despite that, uh, we don't want to uh, for anybody to suffer what we suffered and we are saying uh, just let's have a normal relations. But until this moment, they insist to uh, play or to act as a neo-Ottoman uh, instead of just a peaceful neighbor with Syria. Karim Youssef, why are you laughing, man? <laughs> It's my pleasure, guys, to inform you all this uh, information. I'm not seeing the entire entire comment. Ah, um, okay, that will destroy the week. Israeli statements were very crazy in this regard that the weak will be destroyed and the strong will be respected and peace will be uh, held with the strong. Uh, I don't want to comment on this because uh, Facebook will consider it anti-Semitism, although it has nothing to do with anti-Semitism. It's a clear political criticism, criticism to Israel, but I won't mention it because of the suppression on, on Facebook, unfortunately. For the people, guys, that you are just joined or you haven't joined uh, the um, live streaming since the beginning, please make sure uh, if you go to Syriana Analysis page, Facebook page, you will find there is the like button and next to it uh, there is the following. It's written following. On the following you click on it and then it's it's written see first. Please click on it so that you can see all the posts because there is a suppression of the uh, of the posts on Syriana Analysis and uh, because of this new algorithm policies on Facebook and because, of course, for us, they, we are fake news and CNN is the real news. So. <laughs> so please make sure to do it because it really helps me and I really enjoy and I feel that my efforts are appreciated when a lot of people see uh, the news um, posting. And if you aren't a subscriber of Syriana Analysis YouTube channel, this is the most important part on Syriana Analysis YouTube channel. I post the most important and um, uh, analysis uh, regarding the Syrian situation. On the Facebook page, I mostly post the news. On, on the YouTube page, I mostly post the analysis. So please make sure to go to YouTube and search for Syriana Analysis and subscribe to it. I count on your uh, support, guys. We are almost uh, 26,000 subscribers in one year and nine months, which is a good thing. Uh, I'm planning to reach 30,000 at the end of this year, so with your help, we can do it. Thank you very much, Amjad. Agam, okay. When Bashar Assad, <laughs> when Bashar Assad came to power in 2000, Syria uh, was closed country. Uh, it hasn't, it hasn't have this 
open uh, relationship with outside the world. When Bashar Assad came, he focused first on the education, university education, school education. They, they changed the curriculums. They, he opened, uh, he allowed uh, opening uh, private universities, very good and strong universities, academically speaking. I studied in one of the private universities in Syria called Kalamun University, and uh, I studied this English language in the university because the, curric the curriculum and the books were in English. We studied American in, uh, from American books. Uh, I studied international relations and diplomacy in Syria. And uh, so he uh, focused on the economy, he uh, focused on technology, internet, uh, the mobiles and uh, laptops and all the facilities that the students need. And not only students, for business, uh, everybody. So he opened the Syria to the outside world. He improved the economy, uh, despite the fact that I was, I'm, I was and still against the liberalization of the Syrian economy, but uh, the standing, uh, the living standards of the Syrians grew uh, dramatically under uh, President Bashar Assad. But at the end, it was the boom that happened, because some people uh, couldn't uh, catch with uh, with the developments, economic developments, social developments. So they, unfortunately gone to the lower levels economically speaking and uh, some of them they many of them let's say from these people they join, joined the so-called revolution for economic reasons so uh, although he for example he uh, he created industrial cities in Aleppo which was considered one of the best and the strongest regional industrial cities in the region and that's why the Tur Turkish side when the war started they sent their proxies and they uh, dismantled all these factories and sent them to um, to Turkey. They destroyed the economy of uh, Aleppo and by destroying the economy of Aleppo they destroyed the economy of uh, Syria. So education uh, was great, uh, economy was good uh, on the social uh, aspect, uh, there was more more liberal uh, ideas in in Syria. And when I say liberal ideas, that doesn't mean this liberal uh, idiosity of uh, in the West. Uh, in Syria, it's totally different. More secularization, more women rights. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there wasn't enough work on political reforms under Bashar Assad. So this is one of the criticism that I personally and openly say that uh, we haven't have enough political reforms. We had we haven't have enough press reforms in Syria. Uh, and uh, at the beginning of uh, the crisis, some people thought that we could get something from this, but obviously. Uh, the entire uh, movement wasn't about political freedoms or press freedoms. Uh, otherwise, I could have joined uh, the protests, uh, not to overthrow the government, but to ask them for political reforms, more political openness, more participation in the parliament, more uh, empowerment for the youth and youth partic participation in the political and social affairs. I just mentioned, uh, Aren, the bad things that uh, the the lack of political and press reforms under Bashar Assad. Uh, he, um, the government of Syria claims that because Bashar Assad came to power in 2000, in 2002 there was huge pressure on Bashar Assad to join the war uh, against Iraq and to to kneel in front of the Americans and do what the Americans say, other, other, otherwise they would invade Syria after Iraq. So they had to reprioritize their uh, policies and to create a certain uh, for foreign policy or invest in the foreign policy more, in, um, more than in any other place. And in 2006, there, in 2005, uh, sorry, there was the assassination of uh, Rafiq Hariri. Syria was accused uh, of assassinating uh, Rafiq Hariri. Bashar Assad the regime, quote unquote, was accused. And now we are in 2018. There is no single evidence against it. But at that time, there was a huge political and media hype, which led to uh, the withdrawal of the Syrian forces from Lebanon. 
in 2006 there was the war against uh, between Hezbollah and uh, Iran uh, sorry Hezbollah and uh, Israel so also uh, Syrian government supported Hezbollah in 2008 there was the Gaza war I called the Gaza massacre because there wasn't a war it was only Israel massacring people uh, also Syria invested in foreign policy and in 2008 that was the last war I believe and then in 2011 there was this crisis so the government says we haven't had enough chance to do these reforms because we were investing in foreign policy but I believe we were able to do it and uh, we could have invested more in political freedoms and press freedoms and they could have empowered us more so uh, now I'm uh, empowered let's say myself uh, thanks to social media and the tools will civil marriage be a possibility in the future in Syria very interesting I hope that well Hanin, this is very important thing for the Syrians to understand but we have to indoctrinate them first and educate the, the majority that uh, civil marriage is not against uh, the rule of God or I don't know all this traditions in Syria still some uh, conservative traditions we could make uh, a choice if you want civil marriage you can do if you want a religious marriage you can do it I'm talking for example on a personal level I am a very secular person I believe in civil marriage I am from a family which considers itself liberal but still if I tell them I will do a civil marriage, not a religious marriage, they will say, oh, no, why, why, that, why not? Why not doing a religious marriage? There is still this tradition going on, going on since generations. So it needs time. I mean, everything needs time. Just like democracy, it needs time. Uh, and civil marriage, the concept itself, needs time. It's not a piece of cake. You put it in the oven and then, boop, it's ready. Let's eat it. Uh, the Middle East is duped and a lot of <laughs> social and religious problems to solve before speaking about democracy and civil marriage. Okay. <laughs> okay, Khudr Ali, bravo. What a, a constructive comment. <laughs> Of course, it was a mistake to trust Turkey and Qatar before the crisis, my friend. Um, they were the excess of the Muslim Brotherhood and we allowed them to uh, infiltrate in the minds and hearts of the Syrian people and, and to buy some of the people with their jobs, with their um, cultural these uh, movies and of course it was a mistake to have such a close relationship with Iran with uh, sorry with Qatar and Turkey to extend that uh, it became a family relationship more or less of course it was a mistake in my opinion we should have good relationships with uh, the neighboring countries but not uh, that to give the opportunity for Erdogan or Hamad to invest again in our society I don't think such a mistake will be repeated again True, Kate. And true, Ibrahim. Uh, secular, secularism is still uh, the stage of secularism in Syria is higher in Syria than in any of the neighboring countries. Oh, the Golan Heights, my friend. Uh, it's a very complicated question uh, and um, there will be, an, uh, in my opinion, there will be an attempt to uh, restore Golan Heights with um, limited uh, war um, to uh, shake, reshake the political uh, compromise or the negotiations in this regard. Uh, I rule out a full out uh, war with Israel and uh, it's not a good idea to uh, open a war with such a crazy uh, 
uh, country like uh, such a crazy government like in, in Israel they could use nuclear weapons believe me they have no on they have no hesitation and we are fighting for seven years and uh, it's the last thing Syria needs to have such a war but limited um, confrontation could be useful to uh, reshape reshake these sands and uh, maybe to restart some sort of uh, negotiations in regards to Golan Heights. So guys, I hope this was beneficial for you. I will try to do more live streamings. Uh, I will finish up the live streaming with uh, saying for the people who just started watching please go to uh, the Facebook page of Syriana Analysis and uh, be beside the like there is the following and the following if you click on it you will find C first just click on it so that you can see all the posts because the algorithm is suppressing uh, our posts and also please go on uh, to Syriana Analysis YouTube page and subscribe and we'll see you hopefully very soon uh, guys I will continue doing such live streamings not only uh, on Facebook but also on um, on the YouTube page so thank you very much guys for watching and see you next time ciao